It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of June 25th, 1993. we got three movies to look at today, so let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump right on into it. And we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan reuniting for the second of their three films together. And this one is the one directed by Nora Ephron. It's called Sleepless in Seattle. If you've just tuned in, we're talking to Sleepless in Seattle. You call the radio station? Christmas Eve. He phones in one of those radio call-in shows. He tells them that his dad needs a new wife. And the shrinkette practically forces a guy onto the phone and says, Tell me, what was so special about your wife? Well, Dr. Marshall feels down, I think. It was like... Magic. Magic. Sleepless in Seattle? That's what you call them on the show because he can't sleep. And now 2001 is number. Dear Sleepless in Seattle, you're the most attractive man I ever laid ears on. The guy could be a crackhead. Actually, he sounded nice. You know it's easier to be killed by a terrorist than it is to get married over the age of 40. That's not true. That statistic is not true. That's right. It's not true. But it feels true. Sandy has a girlfriend, Glenda. She's a weightlifter. Well, it's not like her neck is bigger than her head. No, 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 no. I'm not asking you to set me up. What about Walter? Walter and I are engaged. What? Today, I consider myself the luckiest man, 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 on the face, face, face of the earth. There, 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 there. When's the last time you were out there? Uh, Jimmy Carter, 1978. Things are a little different now. I'm having all of these fantasies about some man I have never even met who lives in Seattle. It rains nine months of the year in Seattle. I know! Tiramisu. What is tiramisu? You'll see. Some woman is going to want me to do it to her, and I'm not going to know what it is. You'll love it. What if I never meet him? What if this man is my destiny and I never meet him? Your destiny can be your doom. I want to meet him. Dad, read this, read this. Where is he at? Right. Where's Baltimore? Ah, it's right there. Look, one, two, three, four, there's like 26 states. What I really don't want to do is end up always wondering what might have happened and knowing I could have done something. This is crazy. Uh, that's what I'm trying to tell you. What women are looking for. Tax and a cute pun. This is the one I like. There is no way that we are going on a plane to meet some woman who could be a crazy, sick lunatic. Didn't you see Fatal Attraction? Well, you, can, you can't even turn on the news nowadays without hearing about how some babe thought some guy's butt was cute. So has my butt. Not bad. It's interesting, the history of this movie, because honestly, this movie almost never got made. This was actually conceived... As kind of a romantic drama, it was inspired heavily by An Affair to Remember, which if you've ever seen the episode of The Critic where Cisco and Ebert break up, they even point that out at the very end when they do kind of the parody of the climax of this movie, where they just go, where Roger Ebert just goes, oh, this is just a ripoff of Sleepless in Seattle, and Gene Siskel goes, which wasn't in and of itself a ripoff of An Affair to Remember, and then they both say, which was not that good of a movie to begin with. Um, <laughs> just another way, another way for me to bring up The Critic. Um, but... Um, I've never seen an affair to remember, so this is my first experience to this particular story, but I'm looking at the history behind this movie. A lot of studios actually rejected the script largely because of the fact that the main couple in this movie don't meet until near the end of the movie, which honestly I think is actually one of the pros of this movie, honestly, but this movie took a real long time to get made. The studio, the producer of the movie really believed in it. He actually had a hard time getting it made at TriStar Pictures because they found the emotional script promising but unsophisticated. And uh, David S. Ward, who you know from Major League, and Nora Ephron, who wrote When Harry Met Sally, were brought in to rewrite the script. And this actually was going to be directed by Nick Castle, who uh, most of you will remember as Michael Myers in the original Halloween movies. But he also directed a movie that came out this week, and we'll get to that one later on. He actually left the film because she disagre he disagreed with the comedic approach of the movie. And uh, like I said, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, this is the second time they reunited for... The second of their three movies together, of course, the first one was Joe vs. the Volcano, and then the la the third one was You Got Mail, which came out five years later. Uh, as far as the movie itself goes, it's actually a, re it's a really solid romantic comedy. I do like this idea that the two of them really don't meet until the very end of the movie. I think, that's ver I think it actually plays out pretty well overall because you want to build this relationship up, and you want that moment when they actually get together to be really special, and I think the movie does a very good job with that. Uh, the writing overall is very solid. There's a lot of great jokes, and you have a great cast involved in this. 
Uh, you got uh, Bill Pullman. You see him in the trailer as well, well as uh, Ross Malinger, uh, Rob Reiner, David Hyde Pierce, Rosie O'Donnell, uh, Gabby Hoffman, Victor Garber, Rita Wilson, Carrie Lowell. Just a phenomenal cast of this movie overall. And the movie overall is just a really nice film. It doesn't have to do anything too crazy to go to make it to become a standout film. It just does a simple little love story that works out really well. And there's a lot of great jokes. There's a lot of great humor. There's a lot of great chemistry between these characters and how they how both Hanks and Ryan are supposed to end up together. And it's a nice little story. It's a, it's a nice comfort food romantic movie. And it's a very well-made film. And I know a lot of people... And um, a lot of people have um, is seem to really like this movie, and but honestly, it's hard not to see why because it works mostly because of Hanks and Ryan. They just have this great chemistry that works so well, and the movie overall is just a great crowd pleasing movie. It's amazing to think that in a summer where Last Action Hero was the biggest bomb for Sony Pictures at the time, that they actually they put this there a week before, a week after to try to make up money for it and sure enough not only do, do they do that but it actually becomes one of the biggest surprise hits of the year like a movie that a hit that nobody really saw coming and that's a it's like it's you could de and like i said you could definitely see why it's a very pleasing and very enjoyable movie like it's a wonderfully made film a great di great direction overall a great movie from nora efron who um this is i was gonna say this is her directorial debut but no the last movie she did was uh, uh, this is my life, which she directed first, but this was kind of the movie that jumped her into the, jumped her into becoming more of, a, of a prolific film director because she did this, she did Mix Nuts, Michael, You've Got Mail, Lucky Numbers, Bewitched, Julie and Julia. Uh, this was kind of the movie that started that upward trend, and um, like I said, it's just a phenomenal movie. It works really well because of Hanks and Ryan and this great cast and the great writing, the great direction. It's just a great movie overall. It's a movie that. Really, I've got nothing more to say about it. It's a classic film. It just works so well. If you haven't seen Sleepless in Seattle, you are doing yourself a huge disservice. Go and check this movie out. You will not be disappointed. Uh, with that said, let me go ahead and talk about the other movie that Nick, Nick Castle actually ended up directing. The adaptation of Dennis the Menace, written by John Hughes, produced by him as well. You know, honestly, that teaser probably gives you a good sum up of this movie because it definitely shows some promise. I mean, Walter Matthau as Mr. Wilson is perfect casting, but as far as the movie itself goes, it's pretty forgettable, and I think it mostly has to do with the main kid. Now, I'm not gonna blame the I'm not gonna blame Mason Gamble. He got the job, and you know, honestly, he perfectly fits the role of this of the main character of Dennis the Menace, but. I don't know. He seems a little too happy for his own good. I mean, he's. it looks like he's overacting a little bit too much. Uh, like I said, I can't really blame him for it. He won the role, and on pa on paper, he probably is perfectly fine in this role, but, man, his performance in this movie is way too over the top for this character. And I think that's one of the reasons why the movie doesn't really work as well. Um, overall, it's got a pretty good cast. Christopher Lloyd's in here. Uh, Joan Plowright playing Mr. Wilson's wife. Leah Thompson playing his, uh, Dennis's mother. Uh, Paul Winfield's also in here. I mean, written and produced by John Hughes, directed by Nick Castle. There is a lot of talent here. And I think that's the other reason why this movie works, is because I think Warner Brothers, I think, only hired John Hughes to do a movie that's basically Home Alone, di Die at Home Alone. Like, not the John Hughes that we know and love. Like, the John Hughes that can make all these different movies. It can make 
can pretty much make the same movie, but give it its own flair to make it stand out on its own. When you watch this movie, it's following the Home Alone formula a little bit too much. Like, there are movies where this actually can work. I know that the next summer, there's a there's Baby's Day Out, which I think is a fantastically funny movie, and we'll get to that one later on. It, it that movie as well has a lot of Home Alone ish type of type of moments in there, but I think it's much more funnier than this movie is. I think this movie is trying a little too hard to. It's trying too hard to be another Home Alone movie, but and not and not a Dennis the Menace movie because Dennis doesn't really do a whole lot in this movie that makes him that makes him kind of a menace. He does like the typical th things, like you see in the trailer. He does the thing where he th where he flicks the pill inside of inside of Mr. Wilson's mouth and like he shoots a like he shoots a, f a flaming marshmallow at his head. Like stuff like that is there, but. I don't think that was really the main focus of the movie overall. I think the script really could have used another rewrite to be more kind of like the comic books and the, or the animated TV series at the time. I mean, the animated TV series was a lot of fun. I remember watching that as a kid, but even as a kid watching this movie, I was just kind of like, yeah, this really isn't selling me all that much. It's a movie that... It's a movie where there the intentions are there, there are brief flashes of potential and promise, but... Yeah, it just didn't work for me. It's a movie that's kind of like it's there and it's instantly forgettable. Like I really don't, don't remember a whole lot, but uh, the stuff I did remember about it was not that great. So, so that's uh, Dennis the Menace for you. Not a great movie, to, and uh, certainly one of the first real misfires for John Hughes overall. Uh, with that said, let's move on to the last movie, and that is House of Cards. It's a film so powerful, a story so moving. Ms. Matthews. When did your little girl stop talking? One of today's hottest actors, Tommy Lee Jones of The Fugitive, JFK, and Under Siege. You really do need to come see me, you know. I don't believe she needs to be treated by you or by any other doctor. Stars with Kathleen Turner of this summer's Undercover Blues, War of the Roses, and Princey's Honor in the widely acclaimed story of a mother's fight to unlock the secret that's trapped in the mind of the child she loves. I'm sure you haven't missed the fact your daughter almost killed herself today. Twice. House of Cards. Obviously not the Kevin Spacey series from Netflix, and, um, certainly not the David Mamet movie House of Gains, which I thought that this was at first, but, um, Obviously, that's a different title. Uh, pretty much, that's the plot right there. The de is, uh, this mother moves her family back to her, their house in a quiet suburb, hoping to put the past behind them. And while their son is able to adapt, her daughter is apparently traumatized by the experience and starts displaying this unusual behavior, including building an elaborate tower from playing cards and photographs. And then Ruth is later court-mandated to see this this guy, Jake Beerlander, played by Tommy Lee Jones, an expert in child autism, to help, set, to help her daughter. And... Um, What's interesting about this movie is that this that movie was actually supposed to be released by Fox, but they delayed it for so many years, and then it actually premiered at the Sundance Film Festival without a distributor, and Miramax ended up picking it up, and um, that's how it came out as it is. And um, the movie doesn't look all that good. Looks, I, I should take that back. I mean, the movie could be good because of Tommy Lee Jones and Kathleen Turner, but from the reviews I've seen for it, it's a very mixed bag. Like, you see a couple of reviews where it is promising, but then you see a review like Roger Ebert's where it says, it's all but inexplicable. If it's not interesting, intelligent, plausible, thought-provoking, entertaining, or necessary, the synopsis is so absurd, it would also seem to be unproducible. I mean, I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. I mean, it could be, it could be good, but I haven't heard a lot of great things about it. I don't even know too much about it. I can't really say anything about the movie itself because I haven't seen it, but, um, I mean, it definitely could go either way. It definitely could be a movie that could be pretty good, or it could be a movie that's another Oscar baitish type movie, and, um, I don't know. It's not something I want to rush out to see, but, I don't know, maybe one day I'll definitely check it out, but, um, that is House of Cards. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Uh, next time we meet, we'll delve into the movies of 4th of July weekend, 1993, Halfway point of 93 already. We've got uh, Tom Cruise and John Grisham's The Firm, the re-release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and Pauly Shore in Son-in-Law. So three movies to look at next time around, and we will delve into those on the next episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching, I'll see you next time, and until then, as always, take care.